So today we're going to wrap up our discussion of survey research methods to make you a better consumer of the polls, polling numbers that you'll be hearing talked about. So today we're going to finish up with two more problems of survey opinion research poll. So thinking back to last time, we gave an overview of what survey research was and how it was done, as well as talked about the ways that the way that we do a survey can cause errors, so-called administration-based errors. So today we're going to talk about other types of errors, respondent and societal-based errors. So these are errors that are introduced in terms of how the respondent takes a survey or what's going on around the respondent at the time the survey is taken that may affect their ability to interpret the results. And the second one is instrument-based errors. So these are errors that the pollster makes when writing the survey instrument that then are going to create results that are very hard to interpret or difficult to interpret in the way that you want them to be interpreted. So let's get going and start talking about respondent and societal based survey errors. There are going to be three types of polling errors that we're going to be talking about. The first is administration based. So these are errors introduced in the way that you, the survey, the pollster gives the survey and makes the survey available to respondents. So this is what we talked about last time when we talked about sampling bias and interviewer effects. So today we're going to talk about the last two. The second being respondent and societal based. So these are issues caused by non-response, social desirability, and the context in which the survey is being taken. And the third and final type of polling error that we'll be talking about are instrument based errors. So these are errors that make it difficult to interpret the questions uh, that we get because of how we word the questions, so question wording and the order that the questions are asked of the respondent. So to begin, we're going to talk about respondent and societal based biases. So again, these are errors that are introduced by the respondent or the timing of the survey occurring in society that makes it difficult to interpret what's actually being told to us and by whom. So the first prominent type of, of this type of error is what's known as non-response. So non-response is when some of the people you are trying to contact don't respond to your attempts. That is, some people choose not to take the poll, even though they're offered the opportunity. So we think mo about today, a lot of us have caller ID. And so pollsters are hopefully not in your contact list. And so when you get a call from a pollster on your cell phone or your landline, you're most likely not to answer the phone. Now, it's a really serious problem if the people who are choosing not to answer the phone and not to take a poll varies depending upon the responses they are likely to give. For example, if there's no supporters of President Trump choose to take a poll by CNN, or if there's no supporters of, of Vice President Biden who choose to take a poll by Fox News, then that's going to create a real problem. So again, the issue is non-response because the people are being asked, but they're choosing not to respond. So to say that again, there's an important distinction between sampling bias, which we talked about last time, and which is administrative error, and non-response. In sampling bias, the problem is people are not being asked in the first place, right? So Literary Digest poll in 1936 was not even asking people who did not have a magazine subscription or a telephone. Here, the issue is different. Here, everyone is being asked, but some people are choosing not to respond. So that's a very important difference because the sampling bias is a problem that you as a pollster have. You're not talking to everybody, right? That's on you. That's your fault. Response bias, on the other hand, is the fault of the respondent in some ways. You're asking them to give your, their opinion, and they're choosing not to. So how important of, this, of a problem is this? Well, it may be surprising, but probably not, that no one takes surveys. So here's an amazing statistic. right? So this is how likely someone is to take a telephone survey by year. So in 1997, 36% of the people were willing to take a survey. So that means if a pollster was, taught, was calling 100 people, 36 of them would answer the phone and take the survey. In 2018, that number was 6%. That means for one, every 100 people that a pollster is trying to talk to, only six people would be, choose to take that survey. That is a phenomenal break off. If a pollster is calling 100 people, only six of them are choosing to take the poll. So in principle, that's not a problem. If the six people who are choosing to take your poll nonetheless still reflect the set of all the registered voters. But the problem with there's only six people out of 100, we start to be concerned that maybe there's something a little weird about those six people. After all, if so many people are not taking the survey, what causes them to take the survey? So that causes a pollster to try to figure out, is there a problem in terms of the people who are talking to? So again, it's not a problem of sampling bias because we're trying to talk to everybody. 
The problem is one of non-response bias, which is that people who are willing to pick up the phone, do they differ systematically from the people who choose not to? How do those six people who answered our survey compare to the 94 people who opt not to? One example of non-response bias is an example we looked at earlier. So that is non-response in the exit polls. So here again is from 2018 midterm elections. And the comparison here is how does the percentage who say they voted Republican in the exit poll compare to the actual number or percentage that voted in that precinct itself? So again, it's a non-response problem because the way the exit poll is done is there's interviewers outside of randomly selected precincts and they go up and they talk to every fifth voter that's coming out of the polling place. So there's not a systematic bias in terms of who they're talking to. They're just counting and then talking to every fifth voter. So every voter in principle has the same probability of being asked to take the exit poll. But the issue is that some of them may say no. Maybe they don't want to talk to somebody. Maybe they're busy and maybe because they don't trust pollsters for some reason. So again, this compares how the responses that we get in the exit poll, which are the diamonds, compares the percentage of casting the vote for the Republican candidate in the very same precinct, which means that in general, the people who are taking the exit polls are more likely to say they vote for Democrats than people in the precinct overall. There seems to be a slight bias in terms of who's willing to take those surveys. So that means the non-response bias shifts our results in the more democratic direction. Now, again, these are unweighted results and even unweighted 77% of the results contain the true value. But nonetheless, it says that the people who are taking the exit poll at a precinct are in general more democratic than the overall precinct. So in theory, though, this isn't a, much of a problem because we can re deal with this non-response by waiting. So in this example that we just talked about, so on election night, we know exactly how our exit poll is skewed in terms of by non-response bias. So if we know that how many Democrats are, t are responding to our exit poll, we also know how, what percentage of the voters at that very same precinct voted for the Democrat. So we can just upweight Republicans who answer the exit poll and downweight the Democrats who respond accordingly to make sure that our exit poll reflects the actual population of people casting their ballots at that exit poll. So in theory, waiting is something that allows us to adjust for non-response. But in pre-election surveys in general, this is much more complicated. After all, if we're worried about we're not getting enough Democrats taking our pre-election poll survey, how do you adjust for that? Because in order to adjust for that, you need to know what fraction of the electorate is going to be Republican. Right? So if you're worried about the number of polls that are being released right now are too, are too Democratic or maybe too Republican, well, that's a guess that you have. But that means that you think that the elector is going to be different than what the poll ref shows. But how do you know that? And especially given a polarized electorate right now, where we know that 90% of Democrats are going to vote for whatever Democrats on the ticket, and 90% of Republicans are going to vote for whatever Republicans on the ticket. If you weight the polling results to the partisanship and say, well, I think that you know 40% of my poll respondents should be Democrat, that's going to give you a very different answer than you say, well, I think that 30% of the electorate is going to be Democrat. So you're effectively picking the answer because we don't know what the turnout's going to be by partisans. That's the whole reason why we have an election in the first place. Now, there is the possibility that we have non-response bias. The difficulty is, how would you ever know how to adjust for that? So here, for example, is a very prominent example from the 2012 election. And so there was a raging debate then, as now, saying that the polls were all systematically biased against the Republicans. So this is from when Nate Silver, before he got super famous, when Nate was doing state-by-state -state probabilities to try to predict the, the results of the Obama-Biden campaign against the Romney-Ryan campaign. And so the polls were predicting an Obama-Biden victory, but this individual thought that the polls were all skewed, that there was too many Democrats in the polls and not enough Republicans. So he went poll by poll, adjusting the results to try to make sure the results were unskewed. And as a result, you you can see that instead of going from a, a Obama-Biden victory, it went to a Romney-Ryan victory, and this received prominent airtime. After all, it's quite easy to claim, if you're losing in the polls, to say the polls are skewed, and then you can adjust them accordingly. But again, you need to have some measure or some way of unskewing them if you think that they're wrong. But the problem is that we don't know until election day what percentage of the electorate is going to be Republican and which percentage is going to be Democrat, which means that we don't really have any ability to change it systematically. We can all make guesses to unskew the polls polls in ways that produce different answers, but until election day, we have no idea if they're right. And in some way, because of how partisan everything is nowadays, if you choose to wait to a partisanship, in some ways, you're very much picking the answer. And that we can't trust any polls? 
that with only six out of every 100 people respond to our polls, and we know that we're trying to wait to adjust for non-response by party and by education level, things that we don't know until election day, that it's a hopeless task? Not really. Some of the things we do know, I mean, things are pretty stable for most elections, which means that we are able to anchor our poll results in some systematic fashion. The other thing that we hopefully do is that when you get lots of different polls, yes, each pollster is doing a different weighting adjustment, but by and large, we can look at the entire pool of, of results and try to say, what's the central tendency here? What on average is going on? And so instead of focusing on any one poll, which is gonna be really subject to the particular decisions being made by that pollster and who chooses to respond to that pollster, instead it's best to take a step back and try to get an overall picture of what's going on. Now, this is a little bit contrary to the way the polls are covered, right? Because every new poll result is breaking news. But what this says is that we should probably just treat that as more like noise. Let's wait to see what a lot of the polls say or what more than one says to allow for pollsters to adjust results differently to make sure that the findings are robust. Because insofar as pollsters are able to affect results by their weighting decisions that they're making, we want to make sure that any conclusions or inferences that we make are not going to be really adjusted too much by those particular sets of decisions. And the best way to do that is to rely on more polls and not just take any single poll result as gospel and go off of that. So a second type of respondent and context-based errors can occur in survey research when we're asking about questions that are naturally socially desirable. So this is going to be closely related to what we talked about last time when we talked about interviewer effects, but slightly different. So there the problem was that sometimes talking to a human being can affect the result the respondent will give. Here the concern is that there are some questions or some concepts that we might be asking about that there's such a strong socially desirable answer that makes it very hard to trust the accuracy of the responses that we get. Unfortunately, some of these questions are the most critical to pre-election polling. So one example of how we determine who's going to vote on election day. Now, because we don't know who's going, what's going to happen before it actually happens, one of the main sources of information that we have is simply asking individuals, are you likely to vote? So here's an example from a poll preceding the 2012 Tennessee presidential primary that Dean Gear and I did as part of the Vanderbilt poll. And so we asked two questions to try to assess what turnout was going to be so we can focus on the views of likely voters when predicting the election. So we first asked whether or not people were, were registered to vote or not. So here, you can see that 73% of the people we talked to in Tennessee indicated that they were registered to vote. So in this survey, we just used a random sample of all the telephone numbers we could find, both landline and cell phone, and asked them, are you registered to vote? Nowadays, we can also use voter registration lists to make those phone calls. But here, we just took a random sample of the telephone numbers and asked them who is registered. And then if you're registered to vote, we asked them if you they were likely to vote in the upcoming primary. So here, what you can see is that among the 73% who say that they were registered to vote, 71% percent of those said they plan to vote. So how accurate is this? Well, we can compare what our estimate of the turnout was to what it actually was in that primary. So we know that there was 4.7 million eligible voters in the 2012 Tennessee primary based on the voter rolls in Tennessee. So based on our response, 71% of registered voters said they plan to vote. This would predict a turnout of 3.3 million voters. Pretty straightforward calculation. 4.7 million eligible voters. Based on our survey, 71% of registered voters said that they're going to vote. 0.71 times 4.7 million, 3.3 million. So how close were you? Well, not close. Not close at all. The actual turnout was 627,000, 13% turnout. Whereas 71% of registered voters in our survey said they were going to vote, only 13% of registered voters in the state of Tennessee actually voted. What is going on? So here's the problem that we're asking you, are you likely to vote? And if you're a good citizen, your answer is, of course I'm going to vote. And that doesn't matter if I'm talking to a human being or if I'm taking it over the internet. We all know what the right answer is to that question. So what are we supposed to do? Well, in trying to predict turnout, we're in a better situation because pollsters not only have what you say you're going to do, but we also have past voting behavior from voter rolls to determine who those locally voters are. So people who are over the age of 18, we know what elections they voted on or not in past elections. So a combination of both what you tell a pollster is also what you've done in the past, right? assuming we can make all those merges if you move and try to account for those, but we use those two pieces of information to try to estimate what turnout should be. So again, the problem here is that there's some questions, such as turnout, that there's a respondent bias in terms of the answers that they're going to give. It's socially desirable to, tell, to say some answers, and that's independent of whether or not there's an interviewer. So it's not an interviewer effect, it's rather a respondent effect that we all know, societally based and culturally based, what the right answer to give here, and that can make it really, really hard to assess the answers.
So yet another type of error are errors that are introduced by context. That when or where a poll is being done could affect the meaning of the answers that we receive or even the answers that we receive. So why is this a problem? Well, this has become a problem because everything is now politicized. Everything's either Democrat or Republican. And unfortunately, this partisanship can then imbue other aspects with that notion of partisanship. So things that are completely unrelated to politics suddenly become about politics. And things, answers that we try to get are gonna be reflect whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican more than what you think about what the actual item is that we're asking about. So let me give you some examples to show how partisanship has really sunk into not only everything in our life, but affects the quality and the nature of how we interpret those answers in ways that makes it difficult to compare across time without accounting for that context or without accounting for what was going on politically in the world at that time that would change the answers that people would give. So here's one example of how the context and the political times can affect the answers that you give. So we talked earlier in the first lecture about one use of public opinion polling is to try to attract brand strength. So if you're in product development or marketing, you use public opinion polls a lot to try to figure out where your product is positioned in the entire product space. And so here's an example from one brand favorability tracker, tracking the favorability of Godfather's pizza by whether or not you're Democrat, Republican, or independent. Higher values means more favorable, negative values means less favorable. And so what you can see is that the numbers are tracking along. There's no difference between Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. They all love pizza throughout 2011. And then it starts to get a little bit different. And then by the end of November, 2011, Democrats and Republicans have very different views about pizza. Republicans love Godfather's pizza. Democrats can't stand it. So what in the world happened that made Democrats and Republicans go from loving the same type of pizza, although I guess a five out of it, the scale is not really loving it, but being favorably disposed towards Godfather pizza to have really different views of what was going on? Well, the answer is who the CEO was. So if you recall, which you probably don't because you're very young, but in 2012, Herman Cain was running for president and he was the ex-CEO of Godfather's Pizza. And one of his claims to fame as to why he should be elected president is because of his executive experience. Now, unfortunately, Herman Cain just recently passed away because of COVID-19, but at the time, he was well known as a businessman and made his excursion in the Republican primary. In fact, if we look at the polls, at one point in late October and early November, Herman Cain was even leading the Republican primary in 2012. So again, this crazy graph shows you the ups and downs of what happened in 2012 in the Republican primary, where basically Republicans chose, were trying to, every opportunity not to elect Mitt Romney, it seems like, because there were surges and like, well, what about Perry? What about Kane? What about Gingrich? What about Ron Paul? And the end kind of come back to Romney. But you can see that Kane's surge is right at the end of October and early November. So we know Herman Kane, ex-CEO of Godfather's Pizza, running for president in the Republican primary, 2012, late October, early November, took the lead. And when was that surge in partisanship among Godfather Pizza? Exactly then. So yeah, there were some you know differences beforehand, but it really took off. Democrats really became disliking Godfather's Pizza exactly when Herman Cain surged in the front. So here's an example of something that has nothing to do with politics. Godfather's Pizza. I mean, Herman Cain wasn't even running the pizza anymore, but that became associated with a political figure, in this case, a Republican, and that caused Republicans to love Godfather's Pizza and Democrats to hate Godfather's Pizza. So again, context means everything. So if I'm a marketing researcher at Godfather's Pizza trying to figure out what's going on, there's not much I can do. It's just the nature of politics and our politicized politics that's causing such differences among my consumers depending on whether they're Democrats or they're Republicans. Crazy. So here's another example about how context matters and how everything is now seemingly political. So here's a picture of Big Bird. Big Bird, if you don't know, is a very popular character from a children's television show in the United States. And everyone loves Big Bird. I mean, completely unobjectionable. He's giant, he's big, he's yellow, he's friendly. So when we ask, are you favorable, you know, what do you think about Big Bird? Are you have a favorable, unfavorable opinion of him? Fully 73% in 2012 said they were favorable. 11% cranky people said they were unfavorable and 16% didn't know who Big Bird was apparently. But the crazy, disturbing and striking thing is that if we ask Democrat, 85% of Democrats had a favorable opinion towards Big Bird. Among Republicans, only 55%. So there's a 30% difference in favorability towards Big Bird in 2012. What is going on? Is this just the fact that Big Bird's on public television and Republicans and Democrats have different views on public television? Or is there something deeper and more sinister, not sinister, but is there something different going on that could explain the differences between Democrats and Republican views towards something as seemingly innocuous as a giant yellow bird?
Well, let's see. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Bernie Madoff, Ken Lay, Dennis Kozlowski, criminals, gluttons of greed, and the evil genius who towered over them? One man has the guts to speak his name. Big Bird. Big Bird. Big Bird. It's me, Big Bird. Big, yellow, a menace to our economy. Mitt Romney knows it's not Wall Street you have to worry about, it's Sesame Street. I I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. Mitt Romney taking on our enemies no matter where they nest. So, I guess that explains it. So during the debate in the 2012 election, Mitt Romney took a public position against public television and mentioned Big Bird. President Barack Obama made a commercial about that, and by and large, there you go, Big Bird and favorability towards Big Bird became politicized. So again, when people are answering the questions, I don't think they were really talking literally about whether or not they had a good impression of Big Bird or not. Instead, whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican, and more specifically, whether you supported President Obama or Republican Mitt Romney, then affected how you interpret that question. So favorability towards Big Bird was not just about a giant yellow bird, but now it became a stand-in, right? A proxy for how you thought about President Obama and Mitt Romney. So again, context means everything in this case. Something seemingly innocuous, Big Bird, bright, big yellow, suddenly now became all about whether or not you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. So here's another example of how context can affect the answers that we get, or our ability to interpret the meaning of survey responses over time. So here's the same question being asked across time, and it's obviously in French, but nonetheless, you'll get the main point. So the question was, which country was most responsible for defeating the Nazis in World War II? And you can see in May 1945, among the people that were being interviewed in France, 57% said the Soviet Union, only 20% said the United States, and 12% Great Britain. But fast forward nearly 50 years, May 1994 when that question was asked, now the percentage who's saying the Soviet Union was largely responsible fell from 57% to only 25%. And those saying the United States was primarily responsible more than doubled from 20% to 49 percent. Ten years later, in June 2004, you saw an even continued shift along that dimension. So the United States now was saying 58 percent was largely responsible for defeating the Nazis, and only 20 percent said the Soviet Union. So if you compare the responses from May 1945 to June 2004, you can see a complete and perfect reflipping there. Whereas 57 percent said the Soviet Union in 1945, now 58 percent said the United States. Whereas 20 percent said the United States in May 1945, now in 2004, only 20% said the Soviet Union. So there's obviously different people taking the survey, but what you can see is that as time passes, the perceptions among French individuals and French response to the poll was that it was the United States, not the Soviet Union, who's responsible for defeating the Nazis in World War II. So again, our ability to compare that meaning across time can change dramatically because the context in which respondents are operating, their history and their experiences, differs dramatically from those living in May 1945, those living in June 2004, and so we need to account for all those differences if we want to try to compare those public opinion across that long time period. So now we're going to turn to the third and final type of polling error that we're going to discuss today. These are instrument-based errors. So these are errors in our survey responses that are caused by how the survey instrument is written in terms of either the questions are bad, so these are question wording problems, or the order of the questions that are being asked leads the respondent to be more likely to choose some answers rather than others. So again, these are errors that are introduced because the way the instrument is written causes the response to be more likely to choose some answers than the other. Thus, we're biasing the results by how we're using the survey instrument itself. So one example, involves question wording. So this is drawn directly from the 2012 debates. So here's the exchange between Republican Mitt Romney and President Obama. Romney asks, what things would I cut from spending? Well, first of all, I will eliminate all programs by this test. If they don't pass it, is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Obamacare's on my list. I apologize, Mr. President. I use that term with all respect, by the way. President Obama responds, I like it. Mitt Romney continues, good. Okay, good. So I'll get rid of that. So put aside the fact that that seems like remarkably civil and much different than the world we seem to live in today, the debate here is what do you call the Affordable Care Act that President Obama passed? You call it the Affordable Care Act, right? The technical term, the legal term by which it was enacted, or do you call it Obamacare? And what you call that also affects how you ask about that. So healthcare is a huge issue for the American public. So how does a pollster ask about that? Do they ask about Obamacare? Do they ask about opinions towards the Affordable Care Act? And does it matter? Well, it turns out it matters tremendously. The poll that Dean Gear and I did among Tennessee registered voters in May of 2013, we wanted to get the, what their opinion of the healthcare policy that was, was enacted into law. And we face the same issue. What do you call it? 
Do you call it the Affordable Care Act or do you call it Obamacare? So what we did is we asked the question both ways. So we split the poll up and asked a random half the question, what do you think about the Affordable Care Act? And we asked the other random half, what do you think about Obamacare? Now, obviously they're the same program. So all we're doing is we're testing what the effect of that word choice is on the responses that we get. And what you see is that it's pretty remarkable. So in particular, look at the percentage you say that they have a generally unfavorable opinion towards the Affordable Care Act slash Obamacare. If we use the words Affordable Care Act, only 27% of people interviewed say they have a generally unfavorable opinion towards it. However, if we say Obamacare, then 52% say they have an unfavorable opinion towards it. So again, we're in a Republican-leaning state that President Trump won by 26 points. And so if we prime them by saying this is Obamacare, you can see that the percent who say it's unfavorable goes through the roof. Conversely, if we use the words Affordable Care Act, right, the technical title of the policy itself, fully 57% say they haven't heard anything about it. Now, somewhat scarily, you know, 29% report not having heard enough about Obamacare, but you can see there's a huge discrepancy there, even though it's the same policy. So the words that pollsters use to describe or try to ask about policy can make a huge difference. So in general, this makes it really, 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 really hard to pull on public policy issues because depending on the language that you use, you can get very different responses, especially if that language becomes politicized. Obamacare was what the Republicans used to characterize the Affordable Care Act. And so if a pollster is talking about Obamacare, then you've signaled to the Democrats and Republicans how they should answer. If I use something about the Affordable Care Act, right, that hasn't been as politicized and which is less well known, then you're forcing voters to potentially evaluate what that policy is without relying on their partisanship. And you can get very different answers as a result. So again, the questions that you ask can have dramatically different answers. So here's another example, but this one like swaps the trifecta. Putting aside the fact that it also has sampling bias because it's only sampling Twitter users, likely watch Lou Dobbs tonight, you can see that this is a horribly loaded question that primes partisanship. How would you grade President Trump's leadership in the nation's fight against the Wuhan virus? Clearly a very partisanly biased question. And the response categories... Well, words just escape me. They're not even trying to be subtle here. I mean, come on. Superb, great, very good. Not even a rule for good, much less something negative. So again, not sure you're supposed to take this survey at all seriously, but it's a clear example of a trifecta of problems. Not only do you have sampling bias, you have a horrible question, and then your response categories don't even cover the full domain. There's no way you can even say, give an answer that's less than very good. But it does highlight the ways that a pollster if they really want to, can get whatever answer they're looking for. And that wasn't so at all, but it generally illustrates some of the larger problems that we have as pollsters. How do you ask the question fairly, honestly, and in a way that can collect the right answers so that it's useful? So another concern that we have to have is not only how you ask the question, but what responses you give to allow the respondent to choose bet between, and that can also affect the answers. So in particular, one thing we really worry about sometimes is do you get, let the response the opportunity to say they don't know? So when you ask them, do you support this policy or that policy? Do you say yes, no, and do you allow them to say don't know? Or do you force them to choose? So here's another example from the survey that Dean Gear and I run, the Vanderbilt poll. So in this question, we ask our respondents, registered voters in the state of Tennessee, which political party do you think has a majority of seats in the Tennessee State House? And here again, we are confronted with do we let them say they don't know, or do we force them to guess? So when in doubt, we asked it both ways, again, splitting our sample into two, asking one without a don't know option and one without. And what you can see is that you get very, very different answers. So if we give them the don't know answer, which means that they can tell us that they don't know which party has a majority of seats, you see that 41% say Republicans, 10% say Democrats, but most, 49% of plurality responses say they don't know. So 49% of the people, of registered, registered voters in the state of Tennessee, volunteer that they don't know which political party has a majority seat. If we force them to choose an answer, then we see that 65% say Republicans are the majority, 16% say Democrat, and 19% tell the human interviewer that they don't know. So they volunteer that they don't know. So here you get very different characterizations. It's kind of scary that when they give them the option to say don't know, 49% of registered voters say they don't know which political party is majority, but if you force them to, it seems like they more likely than not, they, they guess correctly. 
So again, depending on whether or not we say of a don't know option, it makes a real big difference in the answers that we get. If we give them a don't know answer, it tends to be the case that response will select don't know. Now, whether that's because they don't know or that's because they're trying to escape answering the question and possibly being wrong, it's hard to know as a pollster. But whether or not you include a don't know can dramatically affect the answers that you get, particularly if you're asking about policy questions. In addition to be able to affect the answers that we get by how we ask the question, and which responses we give to the respondent, we could also affect the answers by the order in which we ask those questions. So one way to illustrate this, to give you an example. And so I think a good example is from an old British sitcom called Yes Minister. And so we'll see what they have to say and you can see how the use of question ordering can have really different effects. So he's going to say something new and radical in the broadcast. What, that silly grand design? Bernard, that was precisely what you had to avoid. How did this come about? I shall need a very good explanation. Well, he's very keen on it. What's that got to do with it? <laughs> Things don't happen just because prime ministers are very keen on them. Neville Chamberlain was very keen on peace. <laughs> yes, he, he, thinks, he thinks it's a vote winner. Ah, that's more serious to done. What makes him think that? Well, the party who had an opinion poll done, it seems all the voters are in favour of bringing back national service. Well, I have another opinion poll done showing the voters are against bringing back national service. <laughs> we can't be for it. Oh, against. of course they can, Bernard. Have you ever been surveyed? Yes. Well, not me, actually. My house. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> well, Bernard, you know what happens. Nice young lady comes up to you. Obviously, you want to create a good impression. You don't want to look a fool, do you? <laughs> no. No. So she starts no. asking you some questions. Mr. Woolley, are you worried about the number of young people without jobs? Yes. Are you worried about the rise in crime among teenagers? Yes. Do you think there's a lack of discipline in our comprehensive schools? Yes. Do you think young people welcome some authority and leadership in their lives? Yes. Do you think they respond to a challenge? Yes. Would you be in favour of reintroducing national service? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I suppose I might. Yes or no? Yes. Of course you would, Bernard. After all you've told you, you can't say no to that. <laughs> so, they don't mention the first five questions and they publish the last one. Is that really what they do? Well, not the reputable ones, no, but there aren't many of those. <laughs> so, alternatively, the young lady can get the opposite result. How? Mr. Woolley, are you worried about the danger of war? Yes. Are you worried about the growth of armaments? Yes. Do you think there's a danger in giving young people guns and teaching them how to kill? Yes. Do you think it's wrong to force people to take up arms against their will? Yes. Would you oppose the reintroduction of national service? Yes. <laughs> there you are, you see, Bernard. The perfect balanced sample. So, we just commissioned our own survey for the Ministry of Defence. See to it, Bernard. So that was obviously a very extreme example in a British accent. But... How much does that apply to what, what pollsters are doing today? How important is it the order by which we ask our questions? Are pollsters just asking questions willy-nilly? Or is there a certain logic in the order in which questions are asked? So to help probe this, we're going to look at some data that the Pew Research Center did in December of 2008. And so the question involves two different questions. One, a question about overall satisfaction with the direction of the country. So it's specifically, all in all, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the way things are going in this country today? And the second question may be more specific to the president themselves. So President George W. Bush, we're also interested in his presidential approval. So a second question that we often ask is, do you approve or disapprove of the way George W. Bush is handling his job as president? So the question we want to know is, does it matter whether we ask presidential approval before we ask about satisfaction in the country or after? So again, this is December 2008, in the midst of the Great Recession, the housing crisis, the stock market was going down, people were being foreclosed and losing their houses, and not a great time to be president or to be a homeowner, given the way the economy was doing in the United States. And so when Pew Research asked both questions, what they did is they did the same thing that Dean Geer and I did. They randomized, and they asked half the respondents presidential approval first, and they asked the other half the overall satisfaction with the country first. So the first set of results say what happens when the overall satisfaction with the way things are going in this country is asked first. So when that question is asked first, you see that 78% of respondents say they're dissatisfied with the way things are going. But if that same question with the same response categories is asked 
After we asked about presidential approval, you see the percentage of dissatisfied Americans goes up 10 points. So dissatisfaction with the way that things are going in this country today goes from 78% to 88%. Put differently, by asking response to think about whether or not they approve the job that George W. Bush is doing as president, that causes them to change how satisfied or dissatisfied they are with the way things are going in this country. And in particular, it increases dissatisfaction by 10 points, from 78% to 88% which means that there's 10% of the population out there that once you remind them of who the president is, apparently, there are even more disapproval that they would have been had you not reminded. So again, the order in which we ask the questions can very much have impact the results that we get. And so when you're trying to evaluate a survey question, like the clip from Yes, Prime Minister said, it's actually kind of important to know what questions were asked before the question you're looking at. Because you can load up a survey questionnaire in such a way that you prime a respondent, which is say that you make the respondent think about certain issues that will make other responses more likely. Now again, if you're interested in what public opinion is generally, this is not something you want to do, right? You want to make sure that the order that you ask does not affect the results. But if you have a particular set of answers that you want to show, i.e. you want to be a bad pollster, then the way that you ask the questions and what things you prime in the minds of the survey respondents can very much have an impact on the responses that you get. So again, the order in which you ask questions by making different features or different things salient in the minds of the survey respondent can affect the answers that we get. So. Political opinion polls can be extremely powerful devices, but they're not without their limitations. And it's really important that you be able to identify what those limitations are. Not so that you can dismiss public opinion polls as it's all garbage, it's all made up, it's fake poll, but rather to think about seriously what are the different ways that polls can go wrong. To empower you to be able to assess critically the types of data that we're often asked to process, often without any context. And so hopefully by this set of discussions that we've had, it helps shown what you need to think about and why if you see any single poll, it's best to dig deeper, right? Often you're not told the things you need to know to really evaluate whether or not you should trust the results, right? But instead, what this lecture is hopefully trying to do is empower you with a set of concepts and questions that you can ask and you can bring to the polls to help make you a better and more informed consumer of this data rich world that we live in. So again, in addition to give an overview of polling, we identify three different ways that polls can be wrong right? One are administration-based errors. So these are errors that are introduced in the way that the survey is being done. Sampling bias, interviewer facts were two of the prominent examples we talked about. A second one are respondent and societal-based errors. So these are issues with non-response, social desirability, and also the context in which the survey is taking place. And the third and final set of errors can introduce in the way the instrument itself is, is based and is written. So the way we ask questions, question wording, and the order in which those questions are asked to respondents can affect the responses that we get. So in order to really understand what's going on, you need to be able to kind of unpack and think about how much is going on in the survey and whether or not you think the survey is, is runs awry of any of these. So again, pollsters are aware of these issues and honest and good pollsters work their darndest to try to make those corrections and fixes and be transparent with what we're doing to empower you, the consumer of those polls, to be able to assess that. But these are all ways that polls can be really, really wrong. And so hopefully the aware, that awareness will help you not dismiss polls entirely, but instead empower you to think critically about what might be going on here. Is this a poll credible or are there potential issues in it? Right? And it doesn't matter what's being done by a Democrat or a Republican or, or whoever's doing it. These are all principles of polling that really are lying at play. So to close this lecture out, I'm going to show an oldie but a goodie. Again, from back, back in the day. So think about as this clip plays, can you identify the different types of errors that's being identified by Jon Stewart when he's picking apart different types of polls? The other thing to note is that the volume is a little bit lower. And so... Pick up your volume uh, and to listen to the, to the remainder of this lecture because this is the last you'll see me of this lecture. Take care and have fun.